This is Sam Tannenhaus, editor of the New York Times Book Review. Harold Bloom is the most famous and controversial literary critic of our time, the author of almost 40 books. The most celebrated of them, published in 1973, is The Anxiety of Influence, in which Bloom theorizes that literary invention springs from each great poet's creative misreading of preceding masters. Here, Mr. Maestro. How are you? I recently spoke with Mr. Bloom at his Manhattan apartment. It was a reunion of sorts. More than 30 years ago, I'd been one of his many graduate students when Mr. Bloom was known as a radical innovator in the study of modern literature. I was considered outré because I did not believe that Thomas Stearns Eliot was Christ's vicar upon earth. Now at 80, he's written The Anatomy of Influence, a summing up of his views on literary invention and the Western canon. In the new book, you say that really the foundation of this extraordinary concept of influence, which we'll discuss in a moment, is your own capacity for memorizing poetry. Why? Even is as it? a little boy, the first poet with whom I really came to terms with in English was Hart Crane, and I still remember how it was. I opened the collected poems of Hart Crane onto the great address to the bridge in the concluding section of the poem that was the first to be written, Atlantis. O thou steeled, S-T-E-E-L-E-D, cognizance, O thou steeled cognizance, whose leap commits the agile precincts of the locks return, within whose lariat sweep and cinctured sing, in single chrysalis the many twain, of stars thou art the stitch and stallion glow. And like an organ thou, with sound of doom, sight, sound, and flesh, thou leadest from time's realm, as love strikes clear direction for the helm. I'm sure I didn't understand the stanza at that time. I still occasionally have difficulties with it now. It's very powerful, incantatory, impacted writing, as Crane at his strongest is. And of course, possession by memory is, uh, is what I try to teach my students, especially now and what I suppose I still teach full-time at Yale. This notion of, of influence um, you're talking about now was not entirely new, right? Critics always knew that poets had read earlier poets, they'd mastered them, but, but they there assumed, was something they different. They assumed always that it was a benign process that it only resulted in gain, not just gain and loss. Where does the loss come in? Well, the loss comes from the fact that you are haunted. The loss comes from the fear, the deep fear, that there's no room for you, that uh, the time and space that you ought to occupy has been usurped or appropriated, that you have no ground upon which to stand, no word of your own to speak, no, no, you know, special sense of, uh, think of Whitman. Whitman, beyond a doubt, comes out of the King James Bible on the one side and Ralph Waldo Emerson on the other. But he said early on, I was simmering, simmering, simmering. Emerson brought me to a boil. You were exploring this theory. You said it was very difficult. It was even difficult for other scholars to follow. And yet you did something unusual. You began to write books intended for general reader. I had so deep a revulsion, as I still do, against what was happening in the academies of supposedly higher education from pretty much 1969, 1970 on, that eventually it drove me out of teaching graduate students, drove me out of the English department at Yale. I became a department of one. I, I, I don't want to take part in this madness in which sexual orientation, ethnic identity, skin pigmentation, gender, origin of one sort or another is deemed to be the most crucial element in apprehending a poet or a playwright or a story writer or a novelist or even an essayist. I, I guess I'm very old fashioned. I, uh, I'm not a modernist. The greatest writers of the 20th century, not in verse, but in prose, were certainly um, 
James Joyce, Marcel Proust, Samuel Beckett, and of course Franz Kafka. It's absurd to call them modernists, even though they were called that. They, their power comes from their continuity with the whole tradition that begins with Homer. So Harold Bloom, it's now the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War. I know. America's I know. greatest poet wrote one of his greatest poems. This is when Lilacs Last but, in the Dorian Yes, th this is the great elegy, the great pastoral elegy, really, for Abraham Lincoln. The kind of preternatural silence of this is so extraordinary. In the dooryard fronting an old farmhouse near the whitewashed palings stands the lilac bush tall growing with heart-shaped leaves of rich green with many a pointed blossom rising delicate with the perfume strong i love with every leaf a miracle and from this bush in the dooryard with delicate colored blossoms and heart-shaped leaves of rich green a sprig with its flower, I break. I've learned to call that the breaking of the tally. I'm not sure that after Lilacs he ever wrote that powerfully again. Thank you, Harold Bloom. Thank you, Sam.